welcome to the webinar. I want to welcome Simon Longstaff, Dr. Simon Longstaff, the Ethics Centre, and here next to me um, have Peter Hunt. And I want to welcome Melissa Warner as well, um, who's um, looking after our education and communications. So we're sitting at a, at a very important time in um, the history of this nation where we're obviously, like all nations, going through a massive crisis. Um, that massive crisis is triggering additional mental health challenges, um, which we're all struggling with. Um, and we already had major mental health issues, obviously, before this crisis. But this crisis is increasing the amount of cases of domestic violence, of depression, of post-traumatic stress disorder, um, significantly, and of course, of homelessness and unemployment, which are triggering further mental health issues as well. Next slide, please, Ilan. And the next slide. Thank you. And the next one. So before the, the COVID crisis, um, and before the bushfire crisis, these were the mental health statistics that we were facing in this nation. One in five Australian adults, chronic mental health illness, one in eight Australians are now on antidepressants, including one in eight, one in four older Australians. And over 45% of Australians will experience mental illness in their lifetime. Next slide. This is um, a slide which indicates the particular outcomes for veterans and also first responders. So there's a number of different sectors of our population who experience far worse ment mental health statistics than the rest of the population. And they can include things as well as um, veterinarians, um, even accountants and lawyers have pretty significant rates of mental illness by comparison to the general population. Next slide. And there's massive costs as well, obviously, of, of all of this mental illness. Um, and these are Productivity Commission figures. Next slide. The treatment outcomes remain inadequate. So there's been no improvement in treatment outcomes over the past 50 years. And what we're seeing is only about 35% of sufferers experiencing remission from either pharmacotherapy or psychotherapy. And a large proportion um, of people who have used these particular treatment outcomes um, have some response initially, but then often relapse after treatment stops. And many of you would be familiar with the vast side effects associated with antidepressant use. PTSD is even harder to treat. So I think we all acknowledge that more of the same is not going to solve the problem. Next slide. And the next one. Thank you. So we're a DGR1 status and Peter, who's here with me, um, we have really um, dedicated this particular part of our life to really helping to alleviate um, mental illness in Australia. And we're putting our time and money behind this by setting up this charity. And this is the fifth charity that Peter and I have set up um, between us. And it's fair to say that in all our previous charities, um, oh, I'll need to turn that off, Peter, sorry. In all our pre, sorry, just one moment, sorry, everyone. In all our, you just have to turn that off, Peter, or you just turn it on, take it off your screen. Sorry, everyone. In all our previous charities, um, though we've provided things like, um, funds, uh, shel you know, shelters for homeless people, choirs, housing, all sorts of other things. At the heart of all mental illness, uh, sorry, at the heart of all disadvantage lies mental illness. So our goal really is to look at a way of alleviating mental illness so that all people um, can have access to these medicines. And Simon will talk about the importance of that from an ethical perspective as well. So our primary focus at the moment is on medicinal psilocybin and medicinal MDMA. And we'll talk about why that is. And our goal is really that these therapies become an integral part of our mental health system. So that if you go to a medical practitioner, you will be given this as an op option in addition to pharmacotherapy and in, in addition to psychotherapy. 
with full disclosure of, of both the risks and the benefits of all different kinds of treatment. Obviously, the high remission rates um, are significant and that's why Peter and I have decided to really focus on these medicines and we recognise how important it is that these medicines become accessible and affordable to all Australians in need. Next slide, thank you. So we've put around us an incredible group of directors and advisory panel and so on. This is our board here, which includes Simon who's on the call and Peter who's on the call. And then we have people like Chris Barry, who's the former head of the armed forces, Jane, who's at Swinburne, the head of mental health there, David Castle, who's the head of psychiatry at St. Vincent's in the University of Melbourne, the Honourable Andrew Robb, the former trade minister, who's suffered with depression for the last 43 years, um, and Mono, who's a lawyer, and Nicholas Medley, who's an entrepreneur. Next slide, please, Ilan. Now you can see our team. Um, so that's growing all the time. And our ambassadors, who are some of the leading researchers and psychiatrists and others in the field. And the next slide uh, shows you our increasing panel of psychiatrists who are jumping on board, um, who are all searching for innovation in treatment because they're unable to, to fully heal the amount of patients who are suffering in this space and urgently recognise the need, the need for, for innovation. And the next slide, um, medical practitioners, pharmacologists, um, psychologists, and the next slide, lawmakers, uh, religious leaders, and other relevant disciplines onto the next slide. And the next one as well. So as I mentioned before, medicinal psilocybin, and particularly to treat depression and potentially obsessive compulsive disorder and addiction, and then MDMA for PTSD and treatment of addiction. The remarkable thing about these medicines is that in only two to three dose sessions, medicine sessions, um, people are often going into complete remission. And this is a massive comparison to conventional treatments, which often require decades or potentially lifetimes of ongoing medication and psychotherapy. The medicines are also considered extremely safe in medically controlled environments and non-addictive. Both of the medicines have been granted breakthrough therapy designation by the Food and Drug Administration in the US, which means that the FDA is actually helping to fast track the approval process, which shows you just how prospective the medicines are by comparison to existing treatments. The next slide. So there's three distinct phases uh, to these medicines. There's preparation, then there's the, the medicinal experience and integration, which is particularly important because for many people, these uh, sessions are considered in the top five most meaningful experiences in their lifetime. And psilocybin, for those of you that are familiar with psilocybin, you understand, takes you into an altered state which connects you to yourself and others and nature in such a powerful way that you feel this sense of oneness and transcendence, uh, which in a sense is beyond normal material definition. And so it's very important that when people come down from that experience that they're able to integrate the experience into their lives to give them new coping mechanisms so that they can um, become more functional in their lives and contribute and have more meaningful lives coming out of this. Also, obviously, in the actual sessions of both MDMA and psilocybin, people will often confront some of the trauma that has been um, contributing to their mental illness and they're able to come to a state of acceptance uh, with that trauma often and, and then are able to move on in a more productive way with their lives as well. We'll talk further about this in the discussion. On the bottom right there, you can see what is a traditional therapeutic session. So you'll see the two therapists, um, the patient lying, which is in a hospital room, but it looks more comfy with an eye mask on. The playlist is very important. So listening to music that is particularly designed for this sort of experience. And um, just a very supportive and safe environment for people. The next slide 
Um, you'll see again this incredible safety record. And there's been no adverse events um, in 119 recent trials. The next slide. So this is um, a piece of research that was done by the University of Melbourne last year, which compares relative drug harms. Um, oh dear, hang on one moment. Just let me check that my battery doesn't run out. Let me touch my phone. Hopefully that's okay. I think that should be fine. Um, so relative drug harms, in the blue you see harm to self, in the red you see harm to others. And you can see there that alcohol is by far the most dangerous um, of drugs, yet, yet it's fully legal and people can have as much of it as they want. And then down the other end of the scale, you can see psilocybin and, and MDMA. So somehow all of the, uh, we got this all wrong. <laughs> and um, so now we need to actually try and even out the scales and make sure that these medicines that are, that are very safe um, can actually be used to heal people um, and it's important to say too that uh, Peter might, might comment on that. Peter, do you want to just come on this screen here? That, you know, medicines uh, can be used for good and for harm. So you might like to mention that, Peter, just about, for example. Yeah, th th this, is a, this is one of these points that w what people ha have a habit of doing is uh, challenging the medicine rather than its use. So, for example, I think we'd all agree that in a heroin at the at the retail level is a horrible thing and it can kill people and it can be very be very addictive and yet you, if you go into hospital and have a general anesthetic there'll be something very similar to heroin in the in the general anesthetic or there probably will be likewise if you go into hospital for nose surgery your uh, your your surgeon may, may well be using a derivative of cocaine uh, the point i'm trying to make here is it's not actually the substance it's how you use it same is true of alcohol, you know, we can go out and have a nice dinner with friends and enjoy a couple of glasses of wine and it's all very convivial. Or we can go out and get completely blind with alcohol, get in a car and kill somebody. It's really how you use a substance rather than the innate problem with the substance in so many cases. Um, so the next slide, thank you, Alain. Um, the patient testimonials that we see are, are quite remarkable and you'll, you'll see that we're starting to collect a lot more testimonials on our website. So indeed, if, if there's people on this webinar who've used these medicines to heal particular conditions, we'd like to see your testimonials and, and might publish them on our website. Uh, we obviously can just put your first name. We don't have to say where you've actually had the medicine experience, but it is very important to start building um, really this database of testimonials because it does just show regulators and, and doctors and others um, just how powerful and effective these medicines are. And you can see that one at the bottom of that page there. I felt I went through 15 years of psychological therapy in one night. And we hear, you know, very similar things all the time of people who've gone through immense healing. The next slide, please, Ilan. Next one. And these are the remarkable effect sizes. And so you can see here that the normal effect size for an antidepressant for depression is 0.3, where psilocybin for depression is 2.0 to 3.1, seven to 10 times more effective. You'll also see there the outcomes for MDMA for PTSD and so on. So these effect sizes are considered off the charts. And again, this is why we're so focused on these medicines because they are so much more effective than current existing treatments. The next slide. So, so what's actually happening here? So particularly psilocybin for depression is bypassing what's called the de default mode network of our brain, which is what is associated with many mental illnesses and keeps us stuck in a default mode of behaving, which keeps us in our default mode. So that's our rigid thinking patterns that we've become used to in our lives that we keep repeating. And there on the far right, you see what is a, uh, an MRI representation of an MRI scan of a person who's got depression. So you can see the very rigid thought loops. Uh, you know, I'm not good enough, life won't work out for me, no one loves me. You know, I'm sure we all know people who, and, and we probably all in our lives have been through these times of of being very down, having these very ruminating, re repetitive and rigid thoughts. And then on the left, you see 
the intervention with the psilocybin where you see this massive neurogenesis where people um, feel not only old neural pathways that start being reconnected, but also new neural pathways that are, co are connected through what's known as neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity. And people start to gain new methods of active coping, which gives patients a sense of agency for their own healing. So rather than just taking pills forever, people actually start to become responsible for their own healing process. Next slide, thank you. So here you can see these outstanding trial results. Um, this is psilocybin trial at Johns Hopkins. You can see that the remissions actually improve over time and that's really unheard of. Mostly what will happen with current um, antidepressants, for example, is a patient may have an initial uplift that may then plateau and then drop away so that the practitioner then needs to either try a different antidepressant or increase the dose for patients. Whereas in these medicines, the remissions are increasing over time. Next slide. MDMA, of course, is um, another substance. And we're not here talking about street ecstasy, which is adulterated with other substances, but pure MDMA, which decreases fear and defensiveness, increasing empathy, trust and safety. And it decreases the activity of the amygdala, which is associated with traumatic memory. So people, when they are using MDMA for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy are uh, in a state of, of lovingness and connection and warmth where they feel safe to talk about the trauma with the therapist. So rather than being re-traumatized, which often happens when people are just talking about it at a conscious level, they're actually talking about their therapy from a space of real acceptance and are then able to go in and heal their trauma and move on with their lives. And this is so significant that the MAPS phase two trial with 105 participants with treatment resistant PTSD of an average of 18 years. The remarkable thing there was a 52% went into remission immediately and 68% at the 12 month follow up. Again, you see the increase in remissions there, but also that's against about a 20% maximum remission rate for current existing treatments. The next slide. Um, so now we're seeing these medicines being trialled for a range of other, treat, uh, other conditions, including early stage dementia, obsessive compulsive disorder, anorexia and other eating disorders, alcohol and other addictions and so on. And the other thing that we're seeing is these medicines being used through special access schemes, which enable a practitioner, particularly psychiatrists, on a case-by-case -case basis to apply to regulators for use of these medicines and therapies where other medicines have been unsuccessful. So that's um, a particular scheme which we're also talking to the regulators about in Australia. But this special access scheme has now been, uh, is now being used in, in the US, in Switzerland and in Israel, and I think soon in Canada. So, you know, in Australia, we need to get ahead of the curve. Um, You'll see here, of course, all the universities around the world and hospitals. This is just a snapshot. There's many more than this who are using these medicines um, and researching uh, and trialling these medicines. Obviously, see there Harvard, Yale, uh, Imperial wow. College, Oxford, and so on. Next slide, you can see two recent announced centres for psychedelic research, Imperial College London and Johns Hopkins in the US. And the exciting thing is that we are working on setting up the very first um, Asia Pacific Centre of Excellence in Australia for the Asia Pacific region. We can talk further about that. Very exciting um, opportunity for this region. The next slide. You can see, well, actually there's, I think about 119 current or recently completed clinical trials now, uh, and a lot there at MDMA and psilocybin. And you can see what happened with the medicines in 1970 when Nixon had his war on drugs. Then there was no research for, pretty much no research or funding for all those years. Really a travesty for humanity because in that period of time, we had that major spike in, in mental illness and loneliness and social isolation and disconnection. So it's, it's interesting to contemplate what the world would look like today if, if these medicines had have remained available and been researched on. 
And then we go to the next slide where we have um, the current St. Vincent's trial, which has been taking place. It's, it's, it's um, just halted at the moment due to the COVID crisis, but is a trial in um, psilocybin for patients who have a terminal diagnosis who are experiencing depression and anxiety due to their diagnosis. And that's replicating some trials overseas. And then the next slide uh, is the, the, his, the history of these medicines, which of course have been used since ancient times in ancient tribes and cultures, indigenous cultures and so on. And then in the 50s and 60s, over 40,000 patients took part in therapeutic psychedelic sessions. They were considered the next big thing in psychiatry. And Stan Groff there talking about psychedelics would be for psychiatry what the microscope is for biology and medicine or the telescope is for astronomy. Quite a remarkable statement and absolutely accurate. And then the next slide um, where we have Nixon's advisor talking about the fact that they lied about the drugs when they had their war on drugs in 1970 and criminalised all use of psychedelics from that point onwards. And unfortunately, the rest of the world followed suit. David Nutt, who's um, one of our ambassadors, says this is the very worst censorship of research and medical treatment in the history of humanity. So I think it's very important for all of us to recognise that that censorship um, occurred and it wasn't due to the science, it was due to political reasons. So the presidency recognised that the medicines were very prospective, but unfortunately didn't pay any heed to that. Next slide, um, our strategy. And um, I'll just let Peter talk about this um, briefly and then we'll move on to the questions very shortly. Yeah, but my medicine Australia, as Tanya was saying, was, was, was set up to make these uh, medicines available in Australia through therapy in a, in a medically controlled environment. And that means we've got to change the paradigm in Australia and the way that these medicines are viewed. Uh, with my medicine Australia, there really are four four prongs to our strategy. The first one is awareness and knowledge building. And that's all about uh, getting out there, talking to all of the key stakeholders. So psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, clini other clinicians, uh, government regulators, politicians, uh, general practitioners, members of the general public, so that people start to realize that actually there are some trials taking place over overseas, which have shown really high remission rates for uh, uh, a number of major mental illnesses that cause suffering in Australia. The other thing we're doing... Hey, Peter, is can I just say that we can only see half your head at the moment? Ah, sorry. You might need yeah, to tilt we, the camera down a bit yeah, um, so that we can see you. We can't see Peter nor myself. <laughs> yeah, that's better, Peter. We can see all of you now. Otherwise, you look like a bit like a Muppet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's fun. The other part of awareness building is, is uh, the summit that's uh, scheduled for November of this year. Uh, you know, assuming that can still take place with the, uh, the current pandemic. Uh, but if it doesn't, it'll just go into the, to the first half of the following year. But, uh, you know, being optimistic, assuming we're able to have it, it'll be held at the Sofitel in Melbourne. We're bringing uh, 15 of the world's leaders, leaders in terms of uh, research uh, and, and use of these therapies to Australia. And the aim is to really raise the profile of these, uh, these medicines and teach a lot of people just how effective they can be. And we've already sold over 300 tickets yeah. for that. Yeah. The second component of the strategy is to make sure- Oh, we... do you want to talk about the chapters? Ah, yeah, I should just say in terms of spreading the word, and bear in mind that we're, we're talking here about the use of these medicines in a medically controlled environment, so we're not talking about recreational use. Uh, what, we're, what we've done is we've set up a number of chapters in capital cities and other major uh, uh, locations around Australia uh, led by people who are keen to uh, to see this this being successful, and the whole idea is to use those local chapters to increase awareness in the in their local communities. So you know, there's one in, there's one in Sydney, there's one in uh, in Tasmania, there's one in in Brisbane, there's yeah. one in Byron. Yeah, I think we have someone even from Ellis Springs on the call. Okay. So <laughs> if you'd like to be Dylan. part of one of these chapters and really really play your part in uh, increasing awareness in, in, across Australia, then please get in contact with us. The second major component to our strategy is, is making sure that uh, as these med medicines are available for use in Australia uh, in a regulatory way, we have uh, uh, therapists that know how to use them. Uh, 
And to do that, we're starting a FERPIS training course in January next year. There'll be two intakes next year. We brought across uh, Renee Harvey, from Imperial, who's a clinical, senior clinical uh, psychologist from Imperial College uh, London, to develop the course in conjunction with other people from around the world who specialize in this area. And we're gonna end up with, with a, a world leading uh, therapist training course, as I say, starting next year, so. And that will, and registrations for that will go online uh, June the 1st. And last week we had 566 people register for the webinar for that particular training. So this, so if you want to be in our training program, get in early. So again, what we're doing is we're, 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 we're predicting potential hurdles. So we don't, want, we don't want the regulators to say, okay, we like the medicines, but there's no one in Australia who's qualified to use them. We want to make sure we've got a whole pool of therapists who know how to use them. So as and when they can be used, the therapists are, are, are ready to go. The third area is to establish an Asia Pacific Centre of Excellence in these therapies uh, based in Australia. So to be uh, alongside the Centre of Excellence at Imperial College and the one at, uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins that Tanya talked about, but a Centre of Excellence that is broader in scope. So not only, look at, uh, not only looking at trials and clinical work, but also looking at things like health economics, developing local agricultural industries uh, for uh, the development of, of, of natural psilocybin and so forth. And the last area is making partnership with the uni. Yeah, in part, yeah, at at, uh, at a major university or universities, and we're we're now having discussions with uh, with universities about that, and uh, we're getting really positive feedback because they see it as a real paradigm shift, and a chance to do something at a global level. Uh, the last area is uh, making sure we have the right environment in Australia to utilise these medis medicines or these therapies. The first part of that is, is regulatory approval. Uh, now there's two ways that uh, you can use medicines in Australia. One, you can get them, get them listed on the TGA register, which is a typical pharma company route. The other way, which is the way that medicinal cannabis is used is, is getting access or getting legal access to these medicines through the special access scheme. And that's the one that we're focused on at the moment. And the feedback we're getting is that the special access scheme is available to uh, psychedelic assisted therapies. So we can, we can talk more about that in, uh, in Q&A. Yeah. The, the other part of this is medicine sourcing and we're way down the track now in terms of sourcing medical grade, GMP standard, psilocybin and MDMA. So again, having the medicines available for, uh, for, for therapy uh, under the special access scheme as and when we get permission to do that. And then a rollout of clinics will, will maybe be part of that. Um, Ilan, next slide, thank you. Um, next slide, thank you. Uh, so how you can help, uh, obviously start conversations, share this info, look at our learn page, volunteer. We have an amazing group of volunteers, some of you probably on this call who are helping us with a range of different tasks. The chapters, um, as Peter mentioned, joining our existing chapters or starting new ones, um, talking to doctors, medical professionals, fundraising, you know, for, for uh, Mind Medicine Australia. So naming us as a charity of choice for some of your own events, for, for your schools, your kids' schools, uh, your workplaces and so on. Following and amplifying our posts on social media, talking to local MPs. We have a, an MP letter which we've devised, which you can use to talk to your local MP. So if you want a copy of that, we can provide that to you. And of course, attending our events and summit and hopefully we'll all get unlocked at some point sooner, we'll be able to connect again at, at, at events as well. And the next slide, thank you, Ilan. Uh, these are some of our key projects and what we're raising funds for. And the next slide, this is our summit in November. And the next slide, which has a number of the speakers, incredible speakers from around the world. Then final slide is um, how people can help and support us through. We're also looking for partners for our summit. So we have we have a number of financial and education partners in kind partnerships as well. So we now now we're going to move to the questions and um, oh there's oh sorry there's some more um well that's all the wonderful speakers. Yeah we're going to start with some ethical questions. So I, I've got a few here. Well, maybe just throw one out to you, Simon, uh, in your role as uh, an ethicist and uh, 
head of the Ethics Centre in Sydney. Uh, just, just talk us through how you see the ethical issues associated with the medical use of, uh, of these therapies. Well, I suppose uh, I should mention a bit of history about this. I, I first got involved uh, in this area when I was approached by Barry Lambert to help him to frame the arguments to government around gaining access to cannabinoids for treating a range of conditions. And the thing that really struck me when I start there is exactly the same essential point, which I think commends itself from an ethical perspective to what MMA is doing. And that is uh, the fact that there really is not a culture anywhere in the world which celebrates suffering. Uh, there are times when suffering cannot be avoided where various cultures have said, well, on that basis, we should you know, see what can be learned through the experience of suffering. But it would be a rather perverse thing if anybody said that suffering is itself a good. So given that uh, suffering at a prima facie level is something which ought to be avoided or prevented uh, or cured, it seems to me that any government that uh, gets in the way of the alleviation of suffering for unsound reasons has got to be asked to provide a justification for why it would do that other than just simply that it responds to prejudice or ignorance or any of the other things which don't amount to good arguments. And, that, and that's really the nub of it uh, for me that uh, we can see now that there are so many cases where people either are suffering or have suffered in a way that could have been curtailed if only uh, these, these drugs had been available within a therapeutic setting. And when I mean, the evidence, as I see it, is clear, there's, uh, there are some cases where I think, you know, uh, you require absolute caution, and this is one of those. So MMA has been extremely careful in terms of the way it approaches the research and makes it clear what it is asking for which is the development of safe, efficacious drugs to all the same standards that apply in any other area, but with this clinical setting, the therapeutic setting put in place. One other thing I'd say about this is that I think my sense of the urgency of this has increased as well as I think Tammy was suggesting during this recent crisis. In my main day of work at the Ethics Centre, one of the things we've been aware of for some time is the mounting case where people either suffer moral fatigue or more particularly moral injury, where they're forced by necessity to make decisions which they subsequently look back on with a sense of shame and ask themselves, how did I become this kind of person? Or worse still, they say, if only I had thought about this or if only I'd considered that situation. And although the worst of it hasn't come to pass uh, in Australia where people really thought they'd be making some terribly difficult decisions in terms of rationing access to things like ventilators and intensive care beds. In other areas beyond medicine, people have been making these extraordinarily difficult decisions, such as, for example, whether or not to retain people or let them go, um, and so on and so forth. And you'd all be aware of it. And you can prevent a lot of the harm uh, if people for example, use services like the ethical service that we offer where even though you still make the tough decision, at least you have a context for doing it. But my fear is that most people won't have taken those preventive measures at this time. And they'll have a very high incidence of people who do suffer this experience of moral injury, which gives rise to depression and post-traumatic stress. The evidence is clear from the military studies that as much as anything else, it's that moral injury which causes these problems. So we're going to find a lot of this, I think, coming out of this recent crisis uh, as people review the decisions they made. And I think uh, given that there are viable treatments that are available, there's an added impetus now, an added ethical impetus, given that this has been created by circumstances partly beyond people's control and partly as a result of society's decisions, uh, that we should really see that we have an additional moral responsibility to make available these treatments if they can be mm -hmm. brought to a state of, as I say, safety and effic efficaciousness um, as soon as possible. Actually, Simon, sorry, that's just reminding me of something. You're, you're being so eloquent tonight. I mean, he's always very eloquent, folks, um, that I must, uh, I would love you to write that into, a, um, into an article for us, <laughs> if you were interested. Oh, well, of course, whenever you ask me, Tanya, I'm always <laughs> interested. It's just a question of time. <laughs> 
I know. Yeah, I know. I should just note there that, that w w when Tanya and I decided to, uh, to set up My Medicine Australia, the first person we, 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 we turned to in terms of coming on the board was Simon. Yes. And yeah. Simon didn't hesitate to, uh, yeah. to, uh, to join totally. us. Totally. One of the questions that's come up, uh, which I think this is from Sam, which I think is a really good question, and it helps us to, to explain the differentiation that we have, is this one. And it's, 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 if the current government, if the current government won't even entertain the idea of pill testing at music festivals, then how will we shift perception at the level of government to see real change? But the answer to that is that we're not getting into the more emotive area of recreational uh, taking of, of these medicines. We're steering way, way clear of it. We're, we're completely focused on the medicinal use. Once you get into the medicinal area, uh, people are much more focused on evidence and trial results and the science. And again, one of the reasons we put around us such an eminent group of uh, leading psychiatrists, psychologists, pharmacologists, and so forth, is to really demonstrate to government that actually, when you're looking at medical issues, and as Simon says, suffering, you have to sort of think afresh and not be held back by the stigmas of the past. So this is very different from the arguments that uh, would be used in, in relation to pill testing at music festivals. And can I just say, I think some of the other members of our board, I mean, it's very hard for a government, uh, even a conservative government, to dismiss someone like the former chief of the defence forces, or uh, someone like Andrew Robb. You know, both by inclination, very conservative people. Uh, Chris Barry, of course, uh, he knows all too well the suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, and Andrew Robb, having suffered this himself, despite being obviously conservative, when he comes to a government and says, actually, this is a seriously important innovation for the health and well-being of the nation, you, you can't just bat them away. Uh, uh, and I think that's one of the great strengths that we have. It's not just the scientists who are in our corner, but also people who governments, even the most conservative governments, can recognise as having a solid argument to put uh, against their own um, potential prejudices. prejudices. No, Absolutely, Simon, and, and what's really, really illuminating for us, even through this webinar series, is just how many really top psychiatrists are approaching us, like almost every day now, wanting to be involved in this movement. And so that credibility is, is really increasing almost on a daily basis at the moment. Um, I have another question for you, I think, Simon, as well, which you may have already sort of answered, but what are some of the human rights issues in terms of assuring these medicines are available to all Australians who are suffering? Other human rights issues, apart from the ones you already mentioned? Well, I mean, I mean people are generally familiar with the human rights literature. Uh, Can you just speak up a little know, bit again there? Human, people are generally aware of the human rights uh, literature and the kind of basic rights that people have uh, so I won't go too much into that. I think the interesting issue here is to do not so much just with human rights, but to do with issues of impairment of citizens in a democracy. Uh, and we don't often think about this, um, the link between human rights, such as the right to education and shelter and things like that, which just seem to be good for enjoying any basic life. But if you make any pretense, as we do in Australia, to being a functional liberal democracy, then the other reason why those rights are important is it's that that enables people to participate fully as citizens. And one of the things that I think we've underexplored is the way in which mental health uh, issues for certain people disenfranchises them as citizens. It, 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 it sets them aside. And, and it's been particularly true in uh, the, the some, somewhat more distant past, where even the discussion of mental health was virtually a taboo in many quarters within society. So I think, Tanya, there's the kind of basic human rights as in what do you need to be able to live a good life to be free from suffering, particularly when it's available to be prevented by safe and efficacious means. But I think there's another angle too for us to think about as citizens in a democracy, which is should we not also ensure that we're not impairing people in a way that effectively disenfranchises them as citizens from participating in our society? Love that one in the article too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so the next question that I have is um, the manufacturing one. Would you want to answer that one or would you want to answer? Um, 
Well, just, oh, do you want to answer the CBT and the AMDR one? Yeah, well, let, let, let's just maybe start with the manufacturing one. Okay. Uh, so the question is, what Australian manufacturing capacity is there for psilocybin? Um, is there an estimated cost of supply? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the first obvious point is that uh, uh, psilocybin is, is a Schedule 9 controlled substance. Uh, which means it can actually be manufactured, but but in order to do that in Australia, it, it, you need appropriate licenses and permits. Uh, it's worth it's worth remembering that uh, psilocybin was first synthesised back in uh, 1938. So the methodology for synthesising it uh, is a well-known methodology, and uh, it, it's not particularly challenging. Uh, there's three basic ways that uh, psilocybin can uh, can be extracted. One is uh, pure synthesized form, which as I say, goes back to 1938. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, through, uh, as, a, as a derivative of, uh, or, or a process which involves using uh, uh, E. coli, which is something that's coming out of the University of Miami, open source. And the third way is obviously to grow the mushrooms in a, a legally controlled environment. Uh, whilst I suspect uh, well, all, all of the trials to date have used the, synth the synthesized form, and that's the form which the regulators tend to be more comfortable with. So I think in Australia, when we start uh, using these medicines in a regulatory controlled way, the psilocybin we'll have access to will be synthesized psilocybin. And yes, there is manufacturing capabilities in Australia to manufacture locally. Thank you for that one. I'm going to um, turn now a question to Melissa. Um, Melissa, one of the questions that came up here is what contraindications with other psychiatric medic medications are most important to be aware of? That's a really important question. Can you speak up a little, Melissa? Sorry. Is that Thank better? You. Not really. You, I could hear you very well earlier. Is that better? It's not bad, but it's not great. Just, just okay. speak up, Melissa. Yeah. Project. <laughs> sure. So but that does depend on the particular medicine. Yeah, that's better. But in general, there aren't any strong contraindications for psilocybin or for MDMA in terms of any dangerous side effects. Though in trials, we do prefer that people who are going to be taking a medicinal psychedelic are off their regular medication, if it's a psychological medication, so antidepressants, antipsychotics generally aren't taken with psychedelics, particularly in trials, because we are wanting to get a baseline of how these medicines affect an individual. That being said, ayahuasca does have a contraindication with antidepressants and that combination is very dangerous. And also MDMA, the combination of antidepressants and MDMA can reduce the efficacy of MDMA. And we actually have, um, in our download section on our website, there's actually um, a, a two-pager that, that shows different medicines and how long you should be off a medicine before you um, have a, a psychedelic medicine. So it's quite, a, quite an informative document as well. Um, the next question is, um, what advantage does your method have over evidence-based therapies of CBD and EMDR, which the World Health Organization recommends? Melissa? Um, well, EMDR is a therapy particularly for PTSD and CBT is for depression. And they're both, I guess, the frontline treatments for in terms of current practice for each condition. Uh, the difficulty with EMDR is that PTSD can be very difficult to treat for a subset of the population who have a, a very narrow therapeutic window. This is because trauma can be so triggering. Actually discussing and doing therapy around your trauma can be re-triggering and increase an individual's anxiety and their symptoms, which leads to a large number of patients dropping out of EMDR therapy and other trauma therapies. This is particularly true of complex PTSD. And we see that in MDMA trials for PTSD, there is a very high rate of completion, which is really encouraging. This is because MDMA does create this sense of safety in a therapeutic setting and catalyze the environment between 
the therapist and the patient. And for CBT, again, there is a lower compliance rate just because therapy is long and has to be done weekly. But the, there's about a, depending on whether, depending on whether the person completes the whole therapeutic process or not, it's between 37 and 41% remission rate. And for psychedelics, we see in depression between 60, around 67% in current trials. So that's the advantage so far. Thank you. Thanks so much, Melissa. Simon, this is um, a question I think for you. How do we remove the stigma that is attached to these medicines? Well, I think the, uh, the, the most effective way is through, um, first of all, by evidence. And so it's very hard to hold a prejudice against consistent facts, although Recently, I've been uh, questioning that assumption, actually, and I've seen some evidence that you can do it, hold it. So it, it's, um, it's, partly about, so it's partly about finding ways, I think. Firstly, I'd say it is evidence. I'd always want to back that. Secondly, about an alignment of that evidence to various groups who have got a motivation to do good uh, and find ways to actually express that so that the argument is now on two fronts, both on the evidential front, but also on the ethical front. Uh, and the third thing, I think, is to name the particular fears that people have in the community that might be fl flowing through to politicians and address those fears. I think one of the big problems often happens when you're mounting ad advocacy of this kind is that the underlying concerns are not named. And because of that, people hold on to them, where if only they had heard them actually being uttered by the advocates for change to be recognised for what they were and addressed, then they can let go of that and start to listen to some of those issues around evidence that would otherwise be blocked. Thank you for that. Um, next one. Um, this one for you, Melissa. I have treatment resistant bipolar 2. Hey, dude, how are you? Can you oh. cut that upstairs for me? Oh, hang Thanks, on. Mate. Ilan, could you please mute all microphones? Thank you. You're welcome, mate. You can go and have a big poo Ilan. now. Oh. <laughs> and are you going to have dinner now? Hello, Ilan. This movie for babies. It might be <laughs> someone who says owl grease. Ilan, can you now unmute Melissa and Simon again? Thank you. Thank you. Um, this one for you, Melissa. I have treatment resistant bipolar 2B, borderline personality um, and PTSD. Why is more not being done in regard to, the, to microdosing psychedelics for treatment resistant mental illness? Is there anything we can do to change this? Yes, yeah, an interesting question. Thanks, Mark, for reaching out. Um, and for wanting to learn more about these novel solutions. In terms of microdosing, there is one trial in New Zealand, and that's investigating microdosing in healthy volunteers. And there's also been a trial looking at elderly volunteers as well, just to prove safety so far and to observe any effects. And, well, it's interesting. We do see that <laughs> in the clinical trials for depression and for PTSD, or actually mainly for psychedelics, depression, and uh, end of life anxiety, it's the magnitude of the mystical or peak experience that seems to lead to strong clinical outcomes. And in fact, changes in the brain are also correlated to the phenomenology of a peak experience. So microdosing, there, this is not the case. It is a more of a frequent, um, very low dose. So it's if it does have an effect for mental illness, it is doing so through a different means. And that does need to be further studied to understand because obviously I see why you'd be curious because it could be that for certain conditions that are quite sensitive to psychedelics where trials have not been completed yet, say bipolar, borderline personality disorder, other personality disorders or complex PTSD where the patient is quite sensitive uh, to alterations in their mental state, that something that is more mild could be of a support for them and even in terms of uh, prophylactically. So I can see why that would be a great avenue of 
research and I do hope that it continues. In fact, Robin Cart Harris recently did say it is an important thing to keep investigating because we don't have conclusive answers yet. Okay, sorry, Peter's just going to jump in. Yeah, there's just another aspect and uh, one of the strengths we've got in, in mounting the argument about the use of these therapies is, is that we're saying the therapies would only be accessible in a medically controlled environment where control over the medicine is secure. Uh, and that's obviously very different from medicinal cannabis where patients can take the medicine home. Once you get into microdosing, you, you do get into the issue of, well, how do you actually ensure that uh, it's taken at the right levels and it's not abused? Because by definition, the medicine has been taken home. Now there are ways to do that, but it's, uh, as I say, one of the great benefits we have with these therapies is they only take place in medically controlled environments. So you don't get into that sort of issue of uh, what happens if the patient abuses uh, the medicines by taking them home. Uh, the next question that we have is, how are you going to sell, promote psychedelic, psychedelic therapy to psychologists, psychiatrists who rely on ongoing repeat business for years for their income? Psychedelics pretty much cure heal after just a few sessions. Simon, would you would you like to have a stab at that question for me? Oh, hang on, uh, Ilan, could you please mute unmute Simon? Thank you. Just a moment, Simon. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So. This is a really interesting question. What it does is it, it, it draws us attention to two worlds that sit side by side at the moment, the world of the market on the one hand and the world of the professions. So the world of the market is one in which the pursuit of self-interest is perfectly legitimate. And those who pursue self-interest do that by satisfying the wants of those who come in. So a paradigmatic case would be somebody walking into a corner store to buy a block of chocolate. The only thing the merchant cares about is whether or not the person can pay the fee for the chocolate or not. Whereas members of the profession are required to subordinate their self-interest and rather than satisfy wants, they have to serve the interests of those who come in. So the same person who might've bought the chocolate in the corner store, if they walk into a doctor's surgery and they're a diabetic, the doctor's going to say, I know what you want, but it's not in your interest that I should provide that chocolate and therefore I will not do so. Now, our society has recognised that those people who enter the professions in the way I've described, who both serve interests and subordinate their own, uh, that there comes a cost to that in a market environment which is so dominant. And therefore, we've entered into a social compact in which we've given various members of the professions certain privileges and status in recognition of the choice they make to be in part of a profession. Now, when you understand that, it means then that a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or anybody else really um, has no choice if they want to stay within a profession and enjoy those privileges, but to choose those outcome processes, therapies, and outcomes which best serve the interests of their patients. And so if you were to persist in an ineffective treatment, merely because it makes the patient dependent upon you or because it provides a lucrative source of income, you would have violated the most fundamental tenets of your profession. And I would expect that as more and more evidence becomes available for the efficacy and safety of these treatments, that you'd, you'd see the professions having to start to examine how they're going to ensure that others, that is members of their own profession, don't deny access because of matters of self-interest, which is, as I say, fundamentally violates the tenets on which all professions are ultimately established. Mm, fantastic answer. Cool. And so, ad know, additionally, um, there isn't a 100% remission rate in trials. And we can improve on that potentially by doing additional sessions with people who have more complex issues. Maybe someone needs three or, or four sessions. And we also haven't seen, you know, 10 year follow ups. Does, uh, if somebody gets triggered again, or if they have a, a challenging life experience, they might need the therapy again. Um, so, and that is also the idea that has been thrown around, for example, in Michael Pollan's book, uh, How to Change Your Mind, or the idea of the, the betterment of well people. And I guess currently we have a particular standard of what mental illness is, but as we have technologies and therapies that can improve the worst cases of mental illness, 
perhaps we can move towards greater psychological well-being as well. Yeah. And um, one, of the, one of the, I think one of the really important things, just also in answer to that question, is that so many people say they can't get into very good psychiatrists and very good psychologists because their books are full because people are not getting better so that they're staying on the books of these wonderful psychiatrists and psychologists. So um, obviously if people get well, then more people are going to get access to those very good practitioners, which is also important. We have here a question on the feed, which is, have there been any discussions with the psychology board in regards to psychologists doing integration therapy sessions and how this aligns with the code of ethics? And it has been, I, you know, just honestly, um, you know, we've had a lot more traction with the psychiatry profession and GPs than we have with the psychology profession so far. That being said, though, there's an enormous amount of psychologists approaching us who are interested in these particular um, therapies and having access to them. And if any of you are psychologists on the webinar tonight, we encourage you to speak to the Australian Psychology Society and other peak authorities to make them aware of these medicines because they keep saying they don't have enough of an evidence base. <laughs> and I think that we, we all understand that with, you know, these medicines being in phase three with the FDA and 119 recent and current trials and with companies starting up you know, both listed and unlisted companies around the world, there is more than enough evidence to suggest that the Australian Psychology Society should be engaging, at least in learning about these medicines. And we're not at all suggesting that people endorse these medicines. We're saying that they should, though, um, promote education. The very least that any of us can do is become educated about these medicines and seek to understand how they work. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Another question that we have here um, is the federal government has recently announced a whole lot of mental health funding for, um, you know, increased mental health support. Would, will Mind Medicine be eligible for any of that funding? Um, well, we, we are pushing for an innovation Mental Health Innovation Task Force through the federal government at the moment. Um, Peter, did you want to comment on that at all any further, that question? Yeah, yeah just to say that, you know, yes, uh, government's spending a huge amount of money and continues to do so on mental illness. But if, but if a large proportion of the people who've got mental illness don't get well, uh, unfortunately what's happening is, is the investment is going into the process rather than achieving uh, remission outcomes. So, for example, going into telehealth and, and other types of, you know, um, processes, but actually there's been no shift in terms of treatment. So, again, we're mounting the argument that actually what we do need is, uh, is government investment in innovation to get people well, and we'll be pushing very hard to make sure that uh, psychedelic therapies uh, become eligible for uh, that sort of funding. But again, you know, we've got to mount the case, we've got to show the evidence. And we've got to be persuasive that uh, this is uh, a whole new, new realm of, uh, of treatment. And this can really shift the dial in terms of people getting out of the system and getting well. And think about what that means. If people get out of the system and get well, that means it's far easier for people to then get access to, uh, to psychiatrists because there'll be more throughput rather than people just staying on the books of psychiatrists because they don't get well. And what we might do now, um, oh, by the way, everyone, we wanted to mention our information short two minute video that we have for Mind Medicine Australia, which many of you will have seen. But if you can share that widely, um, that's a wonderful tool to really explain what we're doing in, in, in two minutes. Um, so we encourage you to share that. And I'll ask Ilan um, to include that in, in, um, in the thank you note that he sends out. But what we'll do now is I think we will... We won't open up all the mics, but if you've got, because that might create a lot of noise if some of you have a, I don't know, something going on in the background, but what we'll do is, uh, no, I think we can open up the mics, can we, Alan? so long as, is that what we usually do, Alan? Um, everybody can unmute their own mic now. Okay, so everyone if you can unmute have their questions, own mic then more now. Than welcome to yeah, unmute. so if you've, got, if you've got a question now that you want to pose to the panel live, um, just just come forth and, and ask your question now and we'll have another say 10 minutes or so that we can 
Simon, are you good to stay on for another 10 minutes or so? Uh, I can stay until quarter two. Okay, okay, so maybe address any questions you have for Simon first up, folks. Um, and just to make this more polite, one thing you can do is if you click the participants button at the bottom of your screen, you can choose to raise your hand. So we'll be able to see who has their hand raised and we can unmute you selectively. Yeah, okay. Ah, so Sam, Sam has his hand um, raised. Sam, okay. So Sam, do you want to ask your question? Elan, can you unmute Sam? Yes. Well, Sam can unmute himself. Oh, really? We can do that now. Okay. But I've just done it. Ah, oh, perfect. Hey, thanks for the awesome webinar again, guys. Um, I just wanted to look at discussing everything about this is fantastic, but what are we looking at for a time frame for these sorts of things? I know it's hard to sort of pitch, um, you know, an exact number, but, you know, are we looking at, you know, trials that like maps will take another three years? Are we looking over the next five years? What's the eventual sort of um, time scale that, that we'd be looking at here? Yeah, uh, look, th th this, th this two, there's two routes, as I mentioned before. One is the uh, prescribable medicine route, where you, you, know, you go through phase one, phase two, phase three trials, and frankly, it seems to take forever. The second route, which is the medicinal cannabis route, is uh, getting access to these therapies through the special access scheme. And we've been putting a lot of work into that to make sure that uh, psychiatrists who would like to use these medicines for their, their patients can uh, uh, put in the appropriate forms and we can provide the appropriate med medical grade medicine. So, you know, we're hopeful that that's going to start this year. We're not, we're not you know, the, the mental health problems of Australia are so severe, particularly coming out of the bushfires and the, uh, this current crisis, that I don't think we can, we can afford to wait three, four, five more years until these become prescribable medicines. We need to sort of go now. And uh, the, the feedback we're getting from the government system is that the special access scheme is available for these sorts of therapies. So, and, it, and if standard. there's psychiatrists on this webinar who wish to apply on a case by case basis for specific patients who are treatment resistant to existing treatments, we would love to hear from you as well. And after our last webinar, we heard from a lot of them. Other questions now, it'd be good, any questions particularly for Simon um, would be useful. Ilan, I don't believe that everyone is unmuted, by the way. No, people can unmute themselves. If they have okay. a question, they can unmute themselves. Okay, terrific. Other questions? Let me just see. Melissa, can you see any other questions? Raised hands there? No. Usually there's stacks of people. Ah, uh, Maria has a question. Okay, Maria. I don't think people can unmute themselves. Yeah, no, they can't. We're, we're getting messages saying they can't, Ilan. Okay, thank you. I think you can, you can hear me now. Um, thank you. Thank you again for a, for a great webinar. Um, it's really informative. Um, I am a student of uh, psychotherapy in Australia at the moment. Um, I, I chose my course, uh, I chose a transpersonal psychotherapy because I am interested in uh, psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, and I am wondering, uh, there's a lot of talk about psychologists and psychiatry. Um, where will this sit as far as can psychotherapists train to, yes. uh, to be a part of these therapies. Yes, yes they can. And what we'll do is last week we had a webinar on this and that has the qualifying um, requirements for the training. Ilan, could you, Maria, could you send us an email and we'll send you the qualifications required for the course? Yes, that would be wonderful. Okay. If you just Thank send you. us a, a general note, we'll send you that. Excellent. Thank okay. you Other very much. Other questions? Let's see if there's any other people who've got their hands waved. Can everyone unmute their mics now? Yep. Good. Okay. Melissa? Uh, yeah. Dale, did you, have, did you have a question, Dale, or not? No, I don't. <laughs> I, just wanna, I just wanted to let you know that people can't unmute themselves. I was trying to unmute myself and a message came up saying the host has to unmute you, so. The, so Ilan, could you unmute? With their hands but up. it's okay now. No, it's working now. I'm saying to you, it's okay. working now. Okay. <laughs> Has Mark 
Toya? Yeah, just a question. I'm very curious as to how many um, psychiatrists, particularly, and psychologists that, that we do have on today. My own experience, and you've already addressed one of my questions tonight, but my own experience with the mental health profession, and particularly in the use of psychedelics, is that no one out there seems to know uh, anything about it. And this is something just through my own research and things that I've stumbled upon, including stumbling upon mind medicine. I'm raising it with these mental health professionals that I deal with as a consumer, and they seem to be totally unaware of these programs. How do we get it out there to the very people that ultimately are, we're hoping are going to administer this? Well, but, but by doing exactly what we're, what we're endeavouring to do here, and that's uh, spreading the word, uh, showing people the evidence. Uh, you know, anyone on this call who's seeing a psychiatrist or has a psychiatrist or goes to their general practitioner, you know, please take it upon yourself to just talk about psychedelic therapies. You know, spreading the word can be done, you know, through the media, but can, it can also be done word of mouth. But, but I do agree, agree with you. That, you know, when we started this uh, about 18 months ago, it was extraordinary how little knowledge there was in Australia about the efficacy of these therapies. You know, particularly given the uh, extraordinarily uh, strong institutions overseas that were leading trials. So, you know, if all of us can take up the mantle to really get out there and educate uh, people in the medical profession, our politicians, our regulators, so that we push people up as quickly as possible into a position of knowledge about these therapies. Re really important question and uh, really important that we all play our part. Other questions? Um, um, Monica? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Lydia? Yes, <laughs> I unmuted myself. It worked out. Um, thank you so much for organizing this. I'm actually dialing in from Europe, so very interesting to see the conversations happening in different parts of the world. Um, my question might be maybe more towards Melissa. And that's to do with what you mentioned regarding uh, specifically sort of counterindications. And from my understanding, you know, most of the clinical trials, uh, counterindication is either psychosis in yourself or your experience of psychosis or in your first degree relative. And I was very curious to understand, is there any evidence to suggest that actually psychedelic medicine can be used to treat psychosis as opposed to potentially trigger it um, as per some of the, from what I understand, you know, research that has been done in the 50s and 60s? Yes, you're right. From research done earlier in last century and around the 1960s, there was some investigation into whether psychedelics, I, I believe it was LSD, can be used to treat acute psychosis. And there was some early success. It's hard to really make extrapolations from the research back then because they didn't really follow the same protocols that we do now in terms of having clear control groups, um, in terms of the particular ways that we even uh, blind data. But it, it is a really interesting point. I guess in terms of strategy, there has been a strong push in terms of psychological contraindications to not include people with psychosis, with personality disorders or uh, bipolar in trials. And this is partially because these are much more difficult conditions to treat. This isn't to say psychedelics wouldn't help. In fact, there has, you know, the, was, um, the, the, the term psychedelic prior to that being used in the literature, um, psychedelics were sometimes called psychomimetics, which is the concept of them actually emulating a psychosis, which was a misunderstanding of how they actually work. Um, and that's even been shown on a receptor level now that there isn't a relationship between how psychedelics work and psychosis, there's not a strong link. Um, but in terms of actual future research, I think we're a, a little way off. I definitely think it would be a wonderful avenue to explore, but it's actually something that's done very carefully because the, the harder the mental illness, the more I think you have to control for the set and setting and for the preparation and integration. There's a, there's a lot more to account for and a lot more risk and there are real risks with psychedelics in terms of the context and the set and setting on a psychological level. Thank you. Um, any other quick 
Simon has to go in one second. So if anyone has a last question for Simon, um, we'd like to to know, uh, hear that now before he he jumps off. If not, then he's been extremely okay. eloquent in answering all your questions. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Bye. Simon. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Simon. Bye. Bye, Thank Simon. you. Clap, clap, clap for Simon. <laughs> all right. Um, any other questions before we go? Monica? 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 You can, uh, unmute your microphone. Is Monica still there? Looks like it, but her microphone is muted. Oh, that, that's better. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Oh, great. Thank you for a wonderful webinar. Um, really interested in all what you've been talking about. My question is about um, how you seem to divide up psilocybin for certain treatments and for MDMA for others. I find many of my clients have so many different symptoms, so I wouldn't know which one to choose. And they obviously have different modes of action. Have you thought about that at all? Yes. Melissa, would you like to answer that one? So just to recap, your question was, for what conditions would you use a particular psychedelic for? Yeah. Yes. MDMA, which ones for MDMA and which ones for psilocybin? So currently MDMA, the phase three trials that are currently, they're on pause for COVID, but currently in progress are for investigating for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think anything that, re that does have an underlying history in trauma is a really great avenue for MDMA assisted psychotherapy. So that includes addiction, um, also, uh, couple therapy was previously used, and MAPS are looking to create a conjoint study between those with PTSD and their partners, because often there is a lot of um, difficulty in, in, the, in the intimate relationships for someone with trauma. And uh, the final one from DMA is quite interesting, is uh, social anxiety in autistic adults. And that's only had one trial so far, but definitely an interesting line of research. And as for psychedelics, so far it's been basically disorders that their common thread is that they are un underlied by a, a kind of neural rigidity, a cognitive rigidity, repetitive thoughts, uh, ingrained patterns of behavior. So things like depression, OCD, anxiety, eating disorders. But there's also def there's definitely applications for in the future looking how a combination or at different times psychedelics could be used as a treatment for trauma as well because in with trauma there is depression, there is a, a, lot, a, a sensation of a, a loss of time. Um, so there's a few avenues yet to be explored that are really compelling. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Unless there's any last questions, um, we're probably going to finish up in a moment, but we encourage you to email us um, and please do um, register for the introductory workshop and the, the summit and spread the word because this is all about word of mouth. If we want to make sure that these medicines are available to people who are suffering and there's millions in Australia who are suffering right now, then it's up to each and every one of us to, to share this information um, and to focus on the science and the evidence as much as we can. Uh, Sorry, could I please ask a question? Yes, of course. Um, will, there, will there be a, um, like a ready-made brochure or information pack to hand in um, to doctors or workers who are yeah. um, curious about? Yep. Yeah, we definitely have that. So if you email us um, and just, and ask particularly for that. In fact, Ilan, could you make a note about that? So as we have like documents like, you'll see them also on our website, a downloads area, which has, there's an FAQs document. It's a frequently asked questions document. There's a one page fact sheet. And if you look on our downloads area, you'll be able to download any of those documents for yourself already. And if, if what you want is not there, then please let us know and we can always create something for you. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to, I'm just thinking, cause like, um, I've, I've actually brought this up with one of the, um, 
even um, workers, like colleagues. Um, but it's so kind of, it's really hard to tell them, like the ones especially that do not know. But I would, I'm, I'm just thinking like if there is a, hey, there's actually an organization that, that is supporting the, um, you know, the, the research and, and yeah. the um, public education of this, and this is the brochure. And then, yeah. and then these are the current researches that are happening at the moment would be yeah. really uh, now, well, helpful. Ilan <laughs> will um, provide in the thank you note to all of you, he'll provide um, a one page fact sheet and also our FAQs document. Thank you. Tomorrow. Um, okay, any last questions before we go? Speak now or send us an email. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there's one there. Is it Amy? No, you're saying farewell. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, we appreciate your support. This is a movement. We all need to, to just be speaking about this and spreading the word. And we thank you all for, for being there. And of course, we encourage you to donate. Um, Peter and I, philanthropists, we have, I don't know, well over 100 donors, small and larger donors, some of whom are on the call. And you can make monthly donations and we really do encourage you to donate and support Mind Medicine Australia. So thank you all. And um, we'll see you. We've got a number of other um, webinars coming up. Alan, did you have that slide there for the upcoming webinars? Ilan? Can't hear you, sorry. Sorry, two seconds. Okay, so next week we have a webinar, I think it's by Dr. Nigel Strauss, and then the week after we have one on anxiety and optimism, um, and then there's another Dr. Nigel Strauss one. So I think we still have three webinars left in the current series, and we also have a, a webinar for our chapter leaders and volunteers as well. So you can see here um, the remaining webinars as well. So we encourage you to, to join us at those and register as soon as possible. And um, thank you all again. Have a wonderful evening.